welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. This occasion gives unsurpassed meaning to the phrase, needs no introduction. <laughs> just as it does to the honor of introducing. David himself tells of his departure from that parish in Stanford, Connecticut, where he served for a year as priest prior to doctoral study. As the dean mentioned earlier, one of the congregants there was William F. Buckley, Jr., whom David knew well, and who spoke on the occasion when the church expressed to David its gratitude and its farewell. Father Tracy, he said, having made St. Mary's Parish uninhabitable, (laughs) is now seeking another home. (laughs) The story at the Divinity School has been to the contrary. During the past four decades, on my accounting, the achievements and collegial practice of David Tracy, more than those of any other single individual, have defined this community and crowned its distinction, and thereby created the intellectual home the rest of us have been privileged to enjoy. It has been the Tracy era, and it continues today with a troubling conflict, the true selves in Augusta, our teacher and our friend, David Tracy. Thank you. to all of you and to one of my closest friends, Chris Gamwell, not only the sharpest mind of the Swift Hall, but one of the most generous. I would like to thank as well all those persons who have made this splendid conference possible. After hearing the three talks this afternoon, anyone who stays with the whole thing have a marvelous education. <laughs> they were excellent. I'd like to thank especially Dean Richard Rosengarten, whose characteristic graciousness and generosity, as in his opening remarks, have made this possible. Professor William Schweiker of the Martin Marty Center, which has sponsored this. Professor Clark Gilpin organized Sandra Peppers, Mr. David Lyons, and all the staff, and especially Professor Susan Schreiner, whose erudition, not only in Augustine, but in the history of the reception of Augustine, helped to form this conference, for her generosity of spirit, her unflagging energy, supervising the many, many details that a conference like this necessarily involves. An example of that generosity is that when she and Claude realized there might be too many speakers, they both graciously said they would save their lectures for the book. Wonderful. There are others, too, who can't be here who will also be in the book, such as Arnold Davidson, Johnny Lacoste. I give my deep thanks to all the distinguished participants in this conference. I've already learned much from the three speakers who have already spoken and expect to learn still more. My guild, always present, (laughs) Irish, (laughs) at the thought that they have all taken a good deal of their very busy lives in time and energy to write and deliver these lectures 
is only less than five, we thought, that any time spent on Augustine or one of his successors is always time very well spent by us all. I would like to thank as well the chairs of my other two university homes, Professor Robert Pippin, chair this afternoon, and is the remarkable chair who rebuilt in the best way the Committee on Social Thought. And Professor Raymond Chiachi, the chair of the Masters of Liberal Arts program. My deep thanks as well to so many friends from so many places, from the United States, France, and Spain, Mexico, and elsewhere, who are so kind to come today. And my deep thanks to my brother Arthur and his wonderful children, maybe his children, but I'm proud to say they're also my nephews and nieces, Kristen and Michael, Aaron and Craig, David and my two godchildren, Marie Claude Rubin and Daniel McGinn. Also, though he's not my godchild, Professor Andrew Griffin. <laughs> <laughs> whose generosity established the Greeley Chair in honor of his parents so many years ago. I have always been proud to be the Greeley Professor, but Andrew is something even better. The Greeley. <laughs> it is remarkable that Andrew and my friend and colleague also here, Mark Marty, celebrated their 80th birthday one on the same day, the same year. Makes one nervous. <laughs> <laughs> this year. Do you know anyone else who writes a lot of Writes well. A feat that was topped only by Professor Robert and Peggy Grant, whom I'm happy to say are also here, and who celebrated their 90th birthday this year. Even I, Deo Valente, may actually, in a few months, despite many predictions, <laughs> including my own, make it to 70. So there is hope for all. <laughs> my deepest thanks for all of you for your attendance. This promises to be, I think, an important educational conference and a book that we all need to read and reread. At last, the lecture. The specialists in Augustine have spoken so well that it's also helpful, I think, in a conference on Augustine and his reception to have non specialists but ones who have read him all their lives and learned from him. Alfred North Whitehead famously remarked that Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Yaroslav Plelikon added that Western Christian theology is a series of footnotes to Augustine. So, fellow footnotes. <laughs> I would like to speak just the two selves, but it's more accurately as I wrote on, the many selves of Augustine, and do they ever become one self? I shall try to give my hypothesis both of many selves and how theologically, but only theologically, the philosophical, literary, and psychological selves become one. However, for purposes of time, I will not, of course, speak of all the aspects of the self that I've written on each in this paper, which is too long, but then please let me mention once the others at the beginning, because otherwise what I do do sound unbalanced on Augustine. Amazing thing, as Philomene said so well, is that it's the mixed character of his contribution, including on the self, that most counts, I think. I'm not reading the section 
upon the elements of the self that he shares with many others, namely that the self is unique not only numerically but metaphysically, that that uniqueness is constituted by relationality, personae, learned from Cicero and his culture and social role relational for each individual, and embodied, as Professor Cavadini showed so well. He never, as other Platonists call, wanted to escape from the body, though he had some problems with it. He is best known, of course, not for these three famous characteristics of self, its unique in the West, its uniqueness, its relationality, and its embodiedness, but its interiority, the journey within. And two aspects of that are very important. I do write about them in the paper, but I've only mentioned them here. The first is his understanding of the self as intelligence and act, as mens, as ratio, as intellectus. As reason or ratio from his earliest dialogues forward, Augustine, as one of the great rhetoricians of his day, learned how to make good rhetorical and dialectical arguments, and as a real artist, the rhetoric was not only the rhetoric of topical argument, but of tropes. He always wanted to head to when the books of the Platonists helped him to something like contemplation, which he reached, I think, in terms of intellect, as the self is intellect, but what Brian Stock rightly calls his meditative readings of the scriptures, his many commentaries and sermons, and his speculations, he liked to speculate, but he wasn't doing polemics. And then finally, his great contemplative work, his greatest work, in my opinion, on the Trinity. Secondly, in this interior journey, he found that more than his fellow Platonists on the intellect, the willing and loving self. Just as histories of theology usually speak of Augustine as the theologian of grace, histories of philosophy speak of him as the philosopher of will. It's odd, though, that there is no single definition of will in all of Augustine. I know. He changes the meaning as he changes the question. Very importantly, of course, intellect and interiority and will, and will as love, must be reciprocal and intertwine. They cannot be, as they become later for the scholastics, so influenced by him, and after the scholastics, up to Kant, separate faculties. Moreover, it's not just, as many philosophers have made out, that he is interested in the endless problems for someone who held to grace so strongly as he did, to is there any freedom of the will, but more importantly, I think he held as Heidegger sees that intelligence itself is always influenced by will, by desire, by emotion, by affect. It is clear, I think, that Heidegger's Befindlichkeit is Augustine's affectus. The will not only chooses or consents for Augustine, the will wills, and the will cannot but will, just as love cannot but love. Well, those are very important aspects of Augustine on the self, which for matters of time I need, but if you're interested in what I think about them, read the text. So I'd like to go on to the equally famous besides relationality, uniqueness, embodiment, intellectuality, will, loving, the sinful and grace self. Most Catholic interpretations of Augustine's understanding of the self from medievals forward are premised on the nature grace paradigm. Most famously in Thomas Aquinas' declaration that grace does not destroy but perfects nature. 
the intellectual and loving aspects of Augustine's understanding of the self in later centuries found new homes. Not mere footnotes, but as you well know, all of you who write, footnotes invade the text and sometimes take over. <laughs> Augustine's insistence on the power of intelligence and act, use Bernard Lonergan's fine expression, found new technical terms and greater conceptual clarity in Thomas Aquinas. And shortly after Thomas, in the far more radical intellectualism of Marguerite Corret and Meister Eckhart, Augustine's view of love as the central key to the self found new medieval homes in daring love mystics, as Bernard McGinn has made so clear, and daring love theology like Bonaventure's, and later, in a more rigorously logical, scholastic form, in the famous voluntarism of Scotus. An emphasis on either intellect or love is never an exclusion for Augustine or the medievals of the alternative reality. Thomas also Thomas always feels obliged to account for the role of will and love in intelligence in act, however intellectualist his position in fact is. The love focused Bonaventure also accounts always, especially in his scholastic works, he worked both kinds, you remember, for intelligence in all its argumentative power and scholastic distinctions, and had no hesitancy in doing so. In fact, it is also a character of Catholic readings of Augustine, even before Thomas and Bonaventure, as Professor Otten has shown us in her work in here, or such later figures as Karl Rahner or Bernard Lonergan or Hearns or as Ron Balthazar, such early modern figures as Descartes and Pascal, to suggest that they ignore these Catholics. The effects of sin, so taken are they by the power of intelligence and will as love. It is, after all, Thomas Aquinas who first insists on what he named the vulnus ignorantiae, the vulnus or wound of ignorance that the mind he so loved <coughs> possessed through original and personal sin as described by Augustine. It is Bonaventure who in his search of the mind for God in Generalium insists at several points how egocentric self-love, self-deluding love can shipwreck the searchers search for God. Mutatis mutandis, the same emphasis, first the intellectually distinguishable but existentially inseparable actualities of intelligence and love in Augustine's understanding of the self. And second, the strict Augustinian strictures on how wounded our intelligence is, how weak, confused, and often directionless our wills can become, can also be found not only in the Catholic readers, but in readings of Augustine by classical modern liberal Protestant theology, from Schleiermacher to ritual until today. However, as you know, there is another self in Augustine highlighted in the Reformation. For classical Reformation theology, the Catholic medieval paradigm for understanding the self shifts from grace transforming nature and perfecting it to the Reformation paradigm not of nature grace, but of sin grace. For Martin Luther and John Calvin, our wills are so in bondage that they believe it theologically naive to speak of grace perfecting so damaged a nature. For Luther, 
our self-deluding intellect is, as Susan Schreiner's work has taught me, even more disordered than our wills. Both intellect and will for him are profoundly damaged, not merely wounded. At the same time, it is a caricature to suggest that the great reformers or the sin-grace paradigm are simply against reason. Despite Luther's rhetorical, polemical delight in denouncing the whore reason. <laughs> After all, it is Martin Luther who insisted, like the scholastics who trained him and whose dialectical arguments he always used very well, <coughs> that the sign of a good theologian is the very scholastic ability to make good distinctions that are not separations. What better description of the relationship of intelligence and will in Augustine? Luther rejected the medieval Augustinian influence phrase fide caritate fumata, in the emphasis on love, to insist on faith alone as primary justification. But he just as strongly insisted that true faith is always a faith active in love. As scholars of early modernity have insisted, the 16th century, both in the Renaissance, think of the meaning of Augustine for Petrarch, or is the Confessions at the top, Puccino, Erasmus, and in the Protestant and Catholic Reformations, was famously a debate, a fierce debate, on how to read scripture, especially Paul. But it was an equally intense debate, historians tell us rightly, on how to read Augustine. Is Augustine on the self best understood through the Catholic, par Catholic and Renaissance paradigm of nature, grace, or the Reformation paradigm of sin and grace? In the next century, the 17th century, we take only France. One sees yet another explosion of different Augustinian emphases on understanding the self. The detached contemplative Augustinian self of Beru, the loving self of Francois de Sales, the sinful Augustinian self of Jansen and Arnaud, what I will call the tragic Augustinian self of Pascal and Racine. So, though I have not read the sections on intelligence and love from the viewpoint of the nature grace paradigm, which I believe is more prominent in more texts of Augustine, but that doesn't mean very much. The sin grace paradigm is also very much there. Quote from the Confessions for Kate. The enemy held my will, and of it he made a chain and bound me. Because my will was perverse, it changed to lust, and lust yielded to become habit, and habit not resisted became necessity in me. They were like links hanging one on the other, which is why I call it a chain, and their hard bondage held me bound, hand and foot. This is clearly the Augustine who attracted the attention of Martin Luther, was to remember an Augustinian monk originally, <laughs> and is even more radical sin grace reading than Augustine's of the bondage of the will. The Augustinian analysis of the will as central, as always willing, as directed to love, but as weak and confused, became as early after his early more optimistic dialogues as early as 397 radicalized in his responses to the questions of Simplicianus. The same sense you find there and in the Confessions, same now both positive and troubled sense about the will became famously far more radicalized in his later anti-Pelagian principled pessimism. 
he could coolly respond to Pelagius himself, whose theology was lucid but dull. <laughs> but in the second generation of Pelagians, Augustine found his best and most skilled adversary, the young bishop and brilliant dialectician of an aristocratic family in southern Italy, Julian of Aquin. As is so frequently the case in intense polemical exchanges, polemics can replace genuine arguments for both parties, and the, conversa and the ideal of conversation is no longer even an ideal, much less a reality. It's true of both of them, I think. Julian, with sometimes good arguments, could lie his skill in dialectics to unfortunate really bizarre, <coughs> ethnic insults that the aristocratic Roman Italian hurled at the now old bishop who did not wish to hear his African heritage insulted <coughs> by these Italians. As when Julian said, leave us alone, you are just the Punic Aristotle. Go back to your Punic donkey. <laughs> Justin was not amused. <laughs> this brilliant combination, polemically brilliant, certainly, of Julian's, provoked August, the late Augustine into fury and at times, regrettably, almost frenzy. As he declared, as he got more and more angry, more and more radical positions, which later became, alas, influential. <laughs> Did he really need, in order to under, in order to continue to describe the weakness, confusion, and twisted character conscience of the will from sin? Did he really need double predestination to make this point? Did he need what even he realized was the ethically repulsive teaching on unbaptized infants? Did he need to declare that the act of sex, which he always affirmed as good, as created and as good, nevertheless in the act suggested a loss of rationality that somehow made it inhuman, not rational? Justice believes that in Eden, there, there was sex, but Adam could decide when. <laughs> the view of the self of the late Augustine is a self not only confused, but now trapped by what today we would call not just habits, but addictions, linked to some mysterious fate-like inherited guilt, as well as personal guilt. This Augustinian self cannot, even through its best efforts of intelligence and love, seem to escape. The ego's every attempt at escape through intelligence and will only seems to trap it further in the quicksand of the selfish, self-centered ego. Our best virtues become splendid vices at times, but self-knowledge can become also self-delusion and it is hard to separate one from the other. Nevertheless, if one reads the recently discovered letters and sermons of Augustine, one can agree with Peter Brown that the old Augustine was not, in fact, the harsh bishop we all thought and that Peter Brown himself had earlier portrayed because of the exchange with Julian. To his congregation at Hippo, Augustine, in fact, became more and more pastoral, it seems, compassionate, even gentle, in those unbelievable times as refugees poured into Hippo from Rome, over want, overrun by German invaders, and as the Vandal armies advanced mercilessly across North Africa, ever closer to Hippo, and terrified his people. The old Augustine, who died, you remember, as the Vandals laid siege to Hippo, Hippo, would not, as other bishops did, leave his people. He was, then as before, always courageous, 
actively compassionate. But, I must not exaggerate, Augustine remained too fierce a character ever to be sentimentalized as having become a sweet old man. <laughs> he remained too active in his fights with polemical adversaries, especially Julian. But he should not be remembered in his late age only for those slash and burn exchanges. The late Augustine is more and more, I think, put it in modern terms, the Dostoevsky himself. Indeed, over the years, Augustine seemed to find the difference within himself, the differing selves of all the Karabatsas, Ivan, Dmitri, even Alosha at times, <laughs> even at times the great person, all the Karabatsa. When, one res- when a modern responds to Augustine's unsettling portrait of the self, I think even those who cannot bear him cannot but feel his uncanny power. He forces an attentive reader to enter the self as an abyss. They reasonably may prefer not to go there. Analogously, Virginia Woolf, in a fine essay, I'm reading the Russian novel, elicits what happens to us non-Russians when we first read the great Russian novelists. We're nervous because we feel we are entering a world that even Dickens and Balzac did not prepare us for. It is a disturbing world. And even though we may wish to forget it, it haunts every now and then as life goes on. So it is with Augustine and the many selves he finds within. One may ultimately reject his view of the self, especially the sin grace view, as too extreme and excessive as one, as many reject Kierkegaard's or Dostoevsky. But rejection, I repeat, is not forgetting. Another modern Augustinian, Kierkegaard, rightly insisted that one can only understand what someone like Augustine or any Christian who's serious means by sin, not sins, quite different to just moral fault, if one first, unless one first glimpses what a Christian means by grace. Otherwise, sin is just a confusing term and maybe an annoying one. If you understand grace, you can also understand that there are not just these moral faults, but the self may be involved in an orientation that becomes twisted and in a way at times trapped. Sin for Augustine is an entire orientation of the self. If it were not for that, Pelagius's austere moralism would more than suffice. Here are the 12 steps to be a better person. <laughs> Just as one does not understand what Buddhists mean by our, and Hindus by our primal ignorance, the vidya, if one reads them by thinking, well, if I could only think more clearly and argue more rigorously, I could dissipate this problem. Primal ignorance. No. Something like purification of the Buddha or various Hindu practices are needed which include, of course, intellectual practices and argument, but are not confined to them. Similarly, one does not understand, I think, what Christians mean by sin if one thinks that it's merely a matter that moral reform and intellectual argument will fairly easily cure. Moral reform and better, more rigorous arguments should always be welcome in theology. When a young man wrote to Augustine and said, I've gone through the philosophers, I've ended up a skeptic, all I can do is hold to faith. Aren't you happy? The bishop wrote back, no. (laughs) Ama valde intellectum. You must love reason fiercely. 
including in faith. He was perhaps, through this notion of sin and grace, perhaps the greatest Christian master of suspicion, trying to locate symptoms and find cure grace for them. In the, to be sure, not the same, but analogous language of contemporary critical theory as distinct from traditional theory, what Augustine meant by sin in the self is not conscious error. That he too agreed could be handled by argument and conversation and reflection, but unconscious, but systemically functioning distortions. Sexism, racism, if you read him, colonialism, are more likely to be systemic, functioning, dis- unconscious distortions than conscious errors. The deluded self's liberation cannot come even through our amazing self power of intellect and will. For Augustine, only other power, God's grace and liberate such a situation. To continue the analogy with psychoanalysis, a psychotic is not liberated by further rational arguments or loving dialogue with his family and friends. But family and friends soon realize, as we now say, that he needs professional help. Someone presumably who can spot symptoms and help them in therapy. It matters relatively little whether our self-delusions are through our own fault or through some past experience, or for Augustine, even inherited trauma, or, I will suggest soon, through the tragic reality of life itself. For I can recall such a civilization and its discontents that after he has helped the neurotic be free of unnecessary neuroses, then they're ready to face the tragedy of life. (laughs) Even neurotics need other help. The right dosages of the right medicines, the right therapies, the right, in intellectual terms, the right critical theories, like feminist theories, psychoanalytic theories, ideology critique, genealogical methods that can spot through the suffering not an individual, but in these logical cultures, systemic distortions. <clears throat> to my knowledge, most Christian thinkers, with great exceptions in the modern period like Reinhold Niebuhr and Paul Ricoeur, Oh, no, I'm sorry. Even right out here. They are very good. Yes. Have been reluctant, as was Augustine, to use the categories of ancient tragedy to clarify what Augustinian inherited guilt or original sin might mean for understanding the Augustinian self. However, after the last bloody century and after so many modern and postmodern philosophical readings of the importance of ancient tragedies. Curiously, more than the theologians, we would think we'd have a more natural affinity to them. But since the post kantians to, to today, the philosophers have taken tragedy seriously as a challenge. As far as I know, Augustine avoided the category tragedy despite what I believe was his own tragic vision, probably because he rejected the notion of fate. Fate, after all, is a dangerous category for anyone who believes, as Augustine did, in an all-powerful God. He does praise it once, to my knowledge, fate in the city of God. That's what he's talking about, is like fate. In Greek tragedy, after all, the gods, even Zeus, are very powerful, but they do not control his fate. They must persuade it. For Augustine, the Greek Zeus, therefore, could never be the biblical Yahweh. 
Yahweh, for Augustine, is omnipotent. Otherwise, is not God. Deo sine Deo, he says. Nevertheless, Augustine presents something like a Christian tragic vision without, I admit, a tragic theology. What might this mean? For example, intertwined through all his work, not only the great commentaries on the Psalms, but the Confessions, even often De Trinitate, he always seems to like to follow a psalm, a commentary on a psalm of praise, and the emotions it evokes, like emotions, to a psalm of lament, even tragic lament. Why, as a second example, did Augustine so love Virgil, whose tragic vision has been called, rightly, I think, the greatest lament in Western culture? Second only to the Psalms, allusions to Virgil's pervade the confessions. For example, it doesn't tell you, but there they are. If you don't think it's Virgil. In the confessions, Augustine, remember, is very troubled that he had been so moved in reading Virgil's account of Dido's tragic suffering and grief after Aeneas cruelly abandons her on the shores of North Africa. He began to fear, he tells us, that this vicarious experience of dramatic and tragic poetic lament was somehow emotionally wrong for him to have. And yet, and yet Augustine is clearly, clearly echoes this very same Virgilian tragic lament when he confesses his own guilt in the confessions for tricking and abandoning his mother Monica, his Dido leaving her grieving on the shore of Carthage after he tricked and abandoned her in the very same way that Aeneas had lied to and abandoned Dido. Sunt lacte me. Rero. Virgil's tears in the very reality of things. Augustine felt, I think, Augustine's tragic laments is on his sensibility today would be called unmistakably tragic as a sensibility. Thus, his initial attraction to the Manichaeans, who, whatever else you think of them, had a deep sense of the tragic character of evil. And his increasingly dark vision as life moved on of the human condition. To call Augustine's vision tragic, is, I admit, another footnote's way of trying to save the Augustinian account of the many selves, including the sinful self, without accepting its accompanying mythologies on original sin. But if that's so, what kind of tragic vision was Augustine's? Even if one attends only to the ancient Greeks, which you probably didn't know, what scholars tell us, but we're around that is, to Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, it is not possible really to claim for Greek tragedy, though many try, a single definition of tragedy in Aristotle's classical sense of what a definition is, a proposition applying to all cases of X and only cases of X. Try one for tragedy. I don't think it's possible. There are elements that are everywhere, but no one definition. In fact, most philosophical definitions of tragedy intrigue me. I've come to believe are generalizations of what tragedy is from reflecting on one preferred tragedy, Oedipus Rex for Aristotle and later Freud, the Aristia for Nietzsche and Arendt, Sophocles Antigone for Hegel and Lacan, Euripides Hippolytus for Seneca and Racine, Homer's Iliad, the beginning of the tragic vision of the Greeks for Simon Weil. In modern philosophy, but I repeat, strangely not in very much modern theology, tragedy became very early in the 19th century, right after Kant, and some argue even Kant on freedom and necessity. Not so sure. A major issue for many German 
philosophers. The Schlegels, Hegel, Schelling, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Schaeffer, Heidegger, Benjamin, Arendt. The German philosophical world was shaken and sometimes fixated on Greek tragedy in an analogous way to the shaking of the theological foundations on grace and nature from the 16th century forward that the tragically teen sin grace paradigm readings of Augustine on the self achieved in theology. Consider the difference. The Greek Christian theologians, save for Macarius in the desert, were not really interested in the tragedies of their own culture, but only in the philosophy, especially Plato. No Greek Christian father found, say, possibly Gregory of Nazianzen. They argue whether he actually did write in text, which is a Christian tragedy. Probably not, but maybe. Found tragedy either a resource or a challenge to their reflections on the Christian self. As Jaroslav Pelikan observes, the early Greek theologians and the Latins, before Augustine, were concerned above all to defeat what they sensed as a deepening sense of fatalism in their surrounding late antique culture. A Christian freedom of will, they rightly thought, in such a fatalistic atmosphere demanded defense and emphasis. Now scholars over the last 20 years have made us more aware of the peculiar intensities the haunting, tragic sense of late antique North African Christians in Tertullian, in Cyprian, in Augustine. That fierce North African sense in its grasp of Christianity never reached the more contemplative and detached shores of Christian Alexandria, much less Cappadocia and Constantinople. Modern theologians, meanwhile, in reading Augustine, have one way or another effect, try to interpret, perhaps most brilliantly, Reinhold Niebuhr, Christian understandings of the self, who a demythologizing and deliteralizing of Augustine's vision. Even Niebuhr and others, however, have kept their distance from a tragedy. He wrote a book, not a very good one, I think, called Beyond Tragedy, which Christianity is supposed to be. Kierkegaard is the major Christian exception in the modern period who takes tragedy seriously for reading Christianity. From his first work, The Concept of Irony and Socrates Forward. Theologians have too often and too fastly, I think, contented themselves with easy declarations that Christianity is beyond tragedy. A few other theologians, including myself, however, think differently. Consider, for example, this quotation from the late influential Anglican theologian Donald McKinnon, quote, <laughs> There is a sense in which Christian theology may be much more than it realizes the victim of the victory won in the person of Plato by the philosophers over the poets, and in particular the tragedians. It is true that Aristotle sought to modify the significance of his, this victory, but he failed to reverse it. I wish to ask the question whether, in fact, the theme of the work of Christ might not receive more effective theological treatment when it is represented not only in philosophical terms, but also as tragedy. Now this I say remembering the supreme significance of the resurrection, but also continually recalling the extent to which, in popular apologetic understanding, the resurrection in Christianity seems to have been deformed through its representation has, in effect, a descent from the cross given greater dramatic effect by a 36-hour postponement. <laughs> it is no more accurate, I think, to describe the ancient Greek tragedies as hopeless. Half those we have ended hope, half do not. Than it is to accuse Augustine 
of having become so pessimistic, the paper argues with him, that his vestigial hope for humankind so darkened that that hope almost became silence. Perhaps left to himself in his old days, he never was by himself, Augustine might have become the despairing village atheist. <laughs> but grace caught him, and he always remained, after his conversion, hopeful. But, as they said of Pascal, a Christian with a tragic sensibility. One can further clarify the tragic aspects in Augustine's portrait of the self by comparing him to certain aspects of the three great tragedians. This is what I suggest. I don't mean he read them, he didn't. I think. Who among the ancient, other than Euripides himself, is more penetrating than Augustine on how our affects and passions can so becloud our minds and twist our wills that we are driven to madness, as it's Pentheus, the young rationalist, complacent king of Thebes, driven to madness, self-destruction, destruction in fact by his own equally mad mother, by the passions released by the terrifying god Dionysius, overcoming reason. The wrong passions, both Augustine and Euripides, can so disorient our loves, our will, our affections, our desires, that they can shift into self-destruction, as they did for Phaedra with her jealousy. Moreover, one finds often that same sense of how human beings can drive themselves mad with the wrong passions or passion that overtakes them. Tragic. The Euripidean likes tragic strain in Augustine is obvious, I think. However, I suggest that it's not his ultimate tragic vision. For his tragic view of our human situation is not finally Euripidean, but something more complex and to me more attractive. You know Euripides, right? I mean we do that, we Euripidean. And Augustine is a peculiar combination, if you think of him in terms of ancient tragedy, of Aeschylus and Sophocles, or elements of each. Augustine's vision of the power of original sin, as he called it, at its most, possesses an Aeschylean gravitas more than it does a Euripidean passion overcoming reason. Aeschylus, like Augustine, you remember, possessed a sense that at times in some families and cultures, there is a necessary and traumatic guilt that is not individual but inherited. It arises from some aboriginal crime of our ancestors. For Augustine, this inheritance is not limited, of course, to a particular family. For him, we are all now the house of Atreus. Aeschylus clearly believed, moreover, in the Aristia, in hope. Because Zeus, for Aeschylus, as for Milton, was Milton's God, was finally just, finally and to persuasive use of the great Greek gift of reason and a positive relationship to the Olympian gods in the law court at the end, justice replaces revenge. We can finally hope to break the cycle of revenge that traps us and destroys us as whole peoples, not only individuals, to persuade the Furies to relent with the other power of the gods. Athena runs the show at the end. As well as, as all Greeks, and I think Augustine, the self-power 
of reason at its best, ama balde, intellectum, <coughs> love reason fiercely. For Eskels, we eventually discover a rare, tragic, not immediately philosophical reason, which is, I think, why the early Nietzsche so loved him. <coughs> His famous line, we receive that wisdom drop by drop through tragic suffering that can purify the mind and heart. Now these Escalian motifs are also in Augustine, transformed to be sure, but not eliminated by his Christian vision. But both Euripidean and tra Escalian tragic notes yield, I think, finally to something peculiarly Sophoclean in Augustine's understanding of the sin-graced and suggesting tragic self. Augustine could have written his own, to be sure again, Christianly transformed version of Sophocles' greatest ode, his ode to humankind as dinos. That is, this strange phenomenon, human being. Wonderful in intelligence, in joyful strength and will and love, at the same time, damaged, trapping themselves in themselves and trapping others with them. For Sophocles, Oedipus is Dinos and a Dynamon, halfway between the gods and mortals. Oedipus is innocent and guilty at once. Antigone, whom Hegel called the most beautiful figure in all of Western literature, is at one and the same time a wondrous fighter for justice, who treats her sister unjustly, indeed cruelly. Ajax, a model of strength and courage, who self-destructs in cowardly shame. All these Sophoclean heroes, these mortals, who, by their daimonic natures, cannot stay within the human limit, must necessarily, it seems, go beyond, tragically, nature, human, nature's <coughs> limit for humans, have become, for Sophocles, important to reflect upon because they may, for him, I think, be our best clue to whether life for Zeus is ultimately just. Unlike Aeschylus, Sophocles is not so sure. Often he hopes and thinks, yes, <coughs> at other times, no. Unlike Euripides, Socrates, however, is very sure, as is Aeschylus, that there is a Zeus, and there are some reasons to hope that Zeus, and therefore life, is ultimately just. He does not have the confidence of hope of an Aeschylus, or in Christian terms, Milton, but he has it. Oedipus Tyrannus ends without hope, but then comes Oedipus at Colonus. Augustine renders, I suggest, without intending to, a late antique Latin version of certain central elements, Euripidean, Aeschylean, and Sophoclean, just element, of an ancient tragic vision. Metamorphized by the transformative powers of grace. Very much Professor Cavatini emphasizing reform, transform, conform, but form. The Latins, unlike the Greeks, were not great tragedians. Oh, why? They were Virgil was, but not in drama. Seneca, the greatest Latin tragedian, presents a more violent, sensational, passionate, Euripidean vision. Out of control, I think without the precarious, tragic balance that Euripides usually attains. Now, Augustine's vision, at once Christian and tragic, is one that the ancient Christian Greek tragedians would, of course, not accept for its Christianity. 
incarnation, <coughs> so forth. But they would certainly respect as tragic. For Gassian theology was not only one among several great Christian theologies in love with philosophy, as he was. Perhaps Augustinian theology could also be read alone among the ancient Christian theologies and still rare among modern theologies as a theology half in love with certain traces of ancient tragic vision alive in his day. At any rate, it is not difficult to note those elements in him. What difference would this make? Quite a bit, I think. It would suggest that even those of us who love Augustine, as I clearly do, it's clear, would not have to blame human beings all the time for everything. <laughs> Without retreating into a superficial Pelagianism. The classic nature grace power, or without rejecting at all the classic under, nature grace understanding of the power of intelligence and the power of will of love. And also Pascal is the best to understand by speaking of human beings, it's like dinos, the grandeur and the misery, all at once. But Pascal the grandeur, I think of some especially through our intelligence. <coughs> And that we know. Nature can kill us, but nature doesn't know it's killing us. We know. The classical nature paradigm, nature grace paradigm, remains invaluable, I believe, for understanding how the other power of God's grace does not destroy, but comes to us as a gift to transform and reform our self power our men's, our discursive reason, into at times possibilities of intuitive vision. Either the mystical visions truth that Augustine had, as Professor McGinn described them, right? Or the intuitive understanding in the contemplations of the De Trinitate. How the same other power, God's grace, does not reject but transforms our loves our passions, our affections, our moods. In some, in the most famous move of Augustine, on love and will, our eros, our desires, our affections, are to be affirmed and transformed by God's gift of love as agape, as pure gift, into what he invented, the human self's new synthetic possibility caritas, to become, in that sense, an erotic and agape loving self. But the same grace paradigm is also needed to understand the fuller Christian vision of the self. Here grace comes not so much, I think, as gift, that too, but as sheer excessive power to invade the twisted will, the sinful self both personally and through inheritance. For Augustine, any honest account of ourselves must admit not only our self-knowledge, but also our self-delusion. Self-knowledge flows from our great intelligence and act in all its wondrous ways, from Socrates' arguments to Plotinus' ultimate vision for Augustine, intuitive vision, yeah. Self-delusion flows from our apparently inveterate powers of rationalization. We cannot stop rationalizing, it seems, as he always points out, not only our most serious moral faults, but even our mistakes. <coughs> and like Freud, he keeps telling us, watch your dreams, watch your slips of the tongue. And like Freud, don't think infants are so innocent. <laughs> watch their greed. Twins at the mother's breast. Custom. Anyone who believes, of course, that self power is sufficient, like Pelagius, to illuminate the self in intelligence and love, 
be not bothered to read either Augustine or the ancient or modern tragic visions and so much art and modern philosophy and art. Such anti-tragedians would, should not get troubled, but remain at rest. They should not think too much about the history of the last century or about their own possible self-delusion. Optimism and pessimism, if they are virtues at all, are natural virtues, dependent largely on our temperament, our orientation, our social and historical circumstances. Hope is another matter. For Augustine, hope is strictly what Aquinas later called not a natural but a theological virtue. That is, we can't achieve it on our own like temperance or patience, but faith, love, hope have to be, if they are at all in us, sheer gift, the gift of God, never first of achievement. And therefore, I would like to suggest, having read only some of the fleet versions of the Augustine in himself, but the others hope I make clear are certainly there on intelligence of nature and grace, not only sin grace, but he also has been needed in his text frequently. Something like an undertow of joy. Surprisingly for me, in what most think as the courageously melancholic Augustine. Consider this sermon, quote, Sing to God in jubilation. This is what acceptable singing to God means, to sing jubilantly. But what is that? It is to grasp the fact that what is sung in the heart cannot be articulated in words. Think of people who sing at harvest time, or in the vineyard, or at any work that goes with a swing. They may begin by caroling their words in song, their joy in words and songs, but after a while, they seem to be so full of joy that they find words no longer adequate to express it. They abandon distinct syllables and words, and they resort to a hum, a hum of jubilant happiness. Jubilation is that shout of joy. It indicates that the heart is bringing forth something that defies speech. To whom then is this jubilation more fittingly offered than to the God who surpasses all speech? You cannot speak of God because God transcends our speech. And if you cannot speak of God, yet do not wish to remain silent, what else can you do at times but hum jubilation so that your heart may tell its joy without words and the unbounded rush of gladness not be cramped by syllables, end quote. An amazing sermon from Augustine, and not an atypical one. Here the word-saturated rhetorician and argumentative philosopher remembers not words, but a time when he was silent and simply listened to a humming, wordless, jubilant, in the fields, perhaps remembering that he himself was a youthful worker in his father's fields at Tagaste. Augustine listens not only in hope now, but in joy. Augustine seems to have frowned himself more and more frequently with this word of joy, this cicada-like humming beyond speech this silent eloquence beyond even the incomparable as it is, late Latin rhetoric of Augustine. He found at the last some silence, some solitude, some peace and serenity. He knew he could not ever earn grace, but he earned that solitude and silence. Thank you.
Thank you very, very much. We have like time a for a few <laughs> questions, uh, which Professor Tracy has agreed to receive, and he will field them. Yes? Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> situation is not as bad as it may seem. <laughs> I'm used to this. I know how to handle it. So are there. I should say, having especially heard the first three excellent lectures, how much I, like other contemporary philosophers and theologians, which, to, which, what, which is what I am, I'm not a specialist in Augustine at all, but I love to read the specialists, <laughs> as I love to read Augustine. But unlike the specialist, I can't read them all. <laughs> there are 40,000 items in the bibliography that are five major Western languages and 500 more every year, articles, books, etc. He is a significant presence in Western culture. And lately, you know, last summer, Jean-Luc Marion was also there, at Fordham University, young Eastern Orthodox theologians who, for the first time in modern orthodoxy, like Augustine, usually is blamed for everything that went wrong in the West, they um, had a conference on him in orthodoxy, which is very interesting. And maybe, eventually, we can drop only a Catholic reading, or only a Protestant reading, or only an Orthodox reading, or only a philosophical reading, and all read this many visioned thinker. Part of his great attraction is that he is so diverse. Well, I thank you all. You've been very kind. And it's late, and we should have this a reception. I think with that, yeah. I think with that, we'll just ask that the discussions you want to have with Professor Tracy, uh, you have tomorrow or at the reception, which follows immediately, to which uh, you all are warmly welcome. Three stories down. Thank you again. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.